Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, December 6th, 2012. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. Well, this week, is your home brew not clear enough for you? Chris Colby, editor of Brew Your Own Magazine, and I talk about filtering your beer. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm Basic Brewing, all one word. On Facebook, I am at facebook.com slash basicbrewing.james. We have the Basic Brewing Radio and Basic Brewing Video page on Facebook as well at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. Thanks again to everybody clicking on the Amazon Associate link on our basicbrewing.com site, especially during this busy, busy holiday season. Whenever you think of shopping on Amazon, think of us first. Go to our website, find the Amazon banner on basicbrewing.com, click on that. That will take you to Amazon, and whatever you purchase there during that little session, we will get a hunk of, and we greatly appreciate your support in that way. It won't cost you any extra, and you'll be helping us to bring you the show. Very helpful. We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Homebrewers Association on our site, too. And our iPhone and Android podcast apps are on their respective stores. Uh, you can also find the Basic Brewing Android app on the Amazon.com store as well. We're on the BlackBerry podcast directory, and we're on the Stitcher app as well. The new Basic Brewing Brewers logbooks are in the house and going out the door. Our 2013 logbooks are a bit of a departure from our past versions. Uh, in the past, we've tied each edition to a particular year, but this year we're making them sort of timeless. You still get 12 two-page spreads of monthly calendars, uh, calendars in the front, but those months are blank. Uh, so no matter if you buy the book in January or July, you still get a full year's worth of planning your brewing, and you still get room in the back of the book to fully document 50 batches of homebrew. Uh, one more innovation this year, we've put a blank table of contents in the front so you can list your batches uh, by page number and quickly get to them rather than having to thumb through, uh, you know, 50 batches of brew sessions to find that one that you are looking for. And many thanks to uh, those of you who have been picking them up. The uh, people in line behind me at the post office are a little miffed when they see me and my armload of packages uh, bellied up to the counter, but it's very gratifying to Steve and me that uh, they are so popular, and it's uh, very nice to see the names of repeat customers, especially coming through the shop, and I'm, uh, I'm very glad that you find the log books useful. I'm also getting a bunch of brewing disaster stories through email. Uh, Steve and I are planning to do our end-of-the-year brewing disaster show, sharing your tales of woe around the brew pot, and uh, what you did to salvage your bad brew day, or sometimes not. I've, I haven't had any stories, new stories this year of uh, exploding airlocks uh, or exploding carboys or, or bucket lids hitting the ceiling. So maybe that means the past stories of clogged airlocks and blow-off tubes are having an effect. Uh, could it be that if we share enough brewing disaster stories, we'll eliminate them altogether? Nah. <laughs> Send your brewing disaster stories to james at basicbrewing.com or use the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please, uh, if you can have them to me by Friday, December 14th, I would greatly appreciate it. Let's take a look into the mailbag at a couple of things. Uh, Tom from Lexington, Kentucky, who is a member of the uh, Brewers of Central Kentucky, or Bach, writes in after hearing the show with uh, Bob Stemsky's experiment comparing late wort hopping with dry hopping. Uh, Tom, uh, Tom writes about his own experiment. He says, On November 11th, I made back-to-back five-gallon batches. The first batch followed my tried-and-true IPA recipe, 60-minute bittering edition with Centennial to 70 IBUs using 10 Sith. Ten-minute additions, uh, one hop, or that's a, an addition at uh, 10 minutes before the end of the boil of one ounce of Citra and one ounce of Cascade. One minute before the end of the boil, one ounce of citra and one ounce of cascade. Immersion chilled, uh, two, and fermented at 63 degrees Fahrenheit with San Diego super yeast. Tom says, in the second batch, I moved all the late edition hops to dry hops. 
and I adjusted the 60-minute bittering edition again with Centennial to 70 IBUs using Tenseth. Uh, immersion chilled to and for a minute at 60 degrees Fahrenheit with San Diego Super Yeast as before. Tom says, I started dry hopping at day 7 of fermentation. The fermentation was pretty much complete by this point with 1 ounce of Sintra and 1 ounce of Cascade. When I transferred to the keg at day 14, I added another 1 ounce of Citra and 1 ounce of Cascade. Mm. Uh, both kegs were force carbonated. They were not quite carbonated when I first started tasting samples. I can definitely say these are two different beers. The dry hopped version reminds me of some extreme hopped commercial beers like Pliny, Hop Slam, and Hoptimum. Yum. I gave samples of each batch to a group of friends this past weekend. They seemed to prefer the dry hopped version. I plan to take samples to the local homebrew club meeting coming up next week. Uh, Tom says I might try to do a talk on the experiment, ask for written feedback. That would be very interesting, very cool. Uh, I'm curious to hear what the homebrew club members say and give their giving their feedback. Th this makes me want to try an experiment with my own homebrew even more. Uh, I appreciate the info, Tom. Tom sounds like he's endorsing uh, leaving out the late wort hops and just shifting those hops to uh, the dry hopping, as did uh, Bob Stimsky. So there you go. Uh, Matt from Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania, writes with this. The main reason I'm emailing you is that I tried your 15-minute pale ale technique and use it for a cranberry ale I like to call Turkey Chaser. Now, if you're not familiar uh, with the 15-minute pale ale, uh, it's an extract beer, so you don't need to boil extract uh, for a whole hour. Uh, I use dry malt extract, and then uh, take the use my standard pale ale recipe, double the amount of hops I would have used at 60 minutes, and then put those at the beginning of that 15-minute boil, and then the, the rest of the hopping uh, is the same. Uh, and that gives you a nice, hoppy beer and a short brew day. Anyway, Matt says, this is my second annual Thanksgiving Day brew. Last year, I did a full extract boil with hop additions and used cranberry extract during bottling to give it the cranberry flavoring. This year, I waited a little too long and was running out of time, so I remembered your 15-minute technique for extracts, and I decided to give it a shot. I must say, since trying the 15-minute extract boil, I don't think I will ever do a 60-minute boil with extract again. Uh, typically, I'm an all-grain brewer, Matt says. It allowed me to knock out uh, two two-and-a-half-gallon batches in the same time it would uh, would have uh, would for me to do a, 60, a full 60-minute boil. So two beers for the time of one. The recipes for the beers were very simple. I made two types, an amber turkey chaser and a light turkey chaser. For both, I just used three pounds of dry malt extract, amber for one and light for the other, one ounce of Sats hops added at start of boil, one packet of US05 ale yeast. And again, these are two, two and a half gallon batches. Uh, Matt says, during bottling, I added one bottle of Simply Cranberry cocktail juice and primed each bottle with one carb drop. Both finished around 45 to 5% ABV, and the end result tasted good as well as turned out to be a big hit during Thanksgiving. The bottles were slightly overcarbed due to the sugar within the cranberry cocktail. I was wondering about that. Uh, for next year, I think I'll use the same technique, but add the simple cranberry to the fermenter a day or two before bottling and allow the yeast to eat up the available sugars from the juice. The finished beer was very similar to that of a shandy. That sounds tasty, Matt. Um, like I say, I was wondering about the, the over-carbonation uh, risk by adding the uh, juice at bottling time um, without letting the, the uh, yeast eat that sugar. It is much safer to add to the fermenter and let the yeast work on that additional sugar before priming and then bottling, unless you listen to our alternative priming show and figure out, uh, I guess you could just prime with the cranberry juice uh, by itself if you knew how much to add. Matt's recipe comes with good timing. At the end of my chat with uh, Chris Colby on filtering beer, we we rambled on a bit, and Chris gave us his recipe for a similar holiday brew. 
Well, Chris Colby, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Hey, James. Thanks for having me on the show. We're going to talk about filtering homebrew. The professionals filter most styles of beer, so why shouldn't we, right? Sure. It's possible. <laughs> <laughs> this article by Dave Miller, who, uh, who has a new book out, mm -hmm. uh, Brew Like a Pro, which means I probably need to get a copy of that book and talk to Dave about that. But um, filtration in homebrewing is kind of a, a controversial topic, is it not? To some people, yeah. Um, home, the majority of homebrewers, and I, I would guess the vast majority, don't filter their, their beer. I, I know I don't. I never have. Um, you know, because if you, if you know how to make beer well and you, you know, keg it or bottle it and let it sit cold somewhere for, you know, usually a week or so, uh, it it drops, you know, maybe not a hundred percent crystal clear, but it drops very, very clear. And for most home brewers, that's, you know, uh, that's good enough. The added step of filtering, you know, is a, enough of a pain in the uh, pain in the butt. Plus, uh, just the added expense of of the filtration equipment, uh, you know, for most people means for most home brewers means means they're not going to do that. But if you, I mean, if you really want to go that last little bit and get, you know, absolutely 100% clear, you know, crystal clear homebrew that you can, you know, hold up a glass and stick a pencil on the other side and read, you know, what's written on the pencil, that kind of clarity, you know, uh, yeah, then then home, then uh, filtering would be the way to go. Of course, for a lot of us, if butt pain and expense were uh, were uh, barriers to us, we wouldn't be in home brewing to begin with. So, <laughs> yeah, that's true. And I mean, a lot of people go to to lengths in other parts of the hobby. Like, um, I mean, I've in the past I've grown my own hops and even barley. Um, you know, a lot of people take a lot of time uh, fabricating their own, uh, you know, brew house. Uh, so it's not, you know, the amount of work involved in filtration isn't, you know, way out of the realm of possibility. It's just it's just something that most home brewers don't choose because it's uh at a time expense and there's a, a little bit of loss of beer involved, you know, because inevitably some of it, you know, gets left in the lines or, or you know, dissolved in the filter and, and that kind of stuff. So what are the benefits? Why why go to all the trouble and expense? Um the only reason I could think of would be is if you really Oh, you don't want just crystal clear beer. You know, there's uh, flavor wise, it doesn't really change the flavor at all. It, you know, in, in in fact, it may very very slightly uh, scrub out a few things. Um, but yeah, it's it's really just uh, a matter of appearance. Yeah, Dave says that it it does has have a little bit of an impact on. Well, it has a big impact on clarity, obviously. Uh, but it also has uh, some impacts on on uh, flavor and maybe aroma and uh, maybe perhaps body. But his argument is, <clears throat> pardon me, that um, if you filter on a regular basis, you're going to develop your recipes around that, and you're going to compensate. Sure. Yeah. If you, you know, if you filter every batch and you, you know, you taste your your pale ale and you say, you know, I think it needs a little more crystal hops. You crystal yeah crystal malt i'm sorry uh you know you just you just add that and it would be you just factored into your whole process yeah so it's i, I mean i don't i also i don't think the amount of or, or another way of putting it a better way of putting it i think people overstate the amount of things that get stripped from beer when it's filtered i mean at the at the filtration size at the pore size you're talking about you're not filtering out like molecules or anything um you know everything. Everything that gives beer its flavor is going to go through. You know, a little bit might get hung up in the, in the filter media, but uh, you know, not much. I don't think. Yeah, I mean, if you if you put beer beer in one side of the filter and the other side came out RO water, that'd be a problem. Yeah. <laughs> he filtered everything but the water molecules out of the. <laughs> that'd be bad. Uh, but yeah, I mean, plenty. Uh, there are plenty uh, commercial beers out there that are wonderful and wonderfully hoppy, and uh, you know, they the commercial brewers use filtration. Of course, they also use um, uh, centrifuges as well. Uh, yep. So there's other technology to their uh, uh, that they use to their advantage. Um, 
but uh, so you get i mean you're you're essentially uh buying time i guess is one way to look at it i mean if you like you said if you put your uh, beer your finished beer in a carboy or a keg and put it in the fridge or the kegerator uh and let it settle for a long time it's going to get pretty darn clear i mean anybody who kegs uh you know that the that the last i mean if a keg lasts for a good long time uh the last beers that you pull out of there are, are much more clear than the, the, the than the first ones that you get out so you're essentially this process it's a lot more trouble and effort and some more expense but you're essentially buying time yeah you uh you can start drinking your your crystal clear beer a little bit sooner yeah you don't have to wait <laughs> for that last beer you pull out of the keg and then you're like that's great and then you go and Start pouring foam with the next glass. <laughs> yeah. S- start cursing. Yeah, finally, this beer is exactly the way. Oh, oh yeah. man! <laughs> so, what are options? I mean, what 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 are we talking filter wise? There's two sort of of, of homebrewers are do filter. There's there's two routes to go. There's one um, that it, it's basically these two plastic. Uh, housing things that clamp together and and hold a, a big relatively big sheet of what's essentially thick filter paper between it and you pump the beer through that filter that way um and the and the second kind is basically just it it's the same idea as you know the your under sink water filter but there are filters that are made like that but to filter beverages and uh so it's you know the same sort of filter uh, housing as you know you would alter to make a a randall or something or you know uh so those are the two two basic kinds of filters and dave spends most of his time talking about the the cartridge filters um the 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 uh, sheet filters are less complex as far as the setup and all uh and you're basically just assembling uh the sheet between in its in its little housing there and just pushing the beer through using CO2, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you um you take the the filter and um you need to wet it first. Then you then you assemble the uh you assemble the, the equipment and then you need to pump uh you need to push sanitizing solution through the whole thing. Um and then perhaps a little water to rinse it, depending on how you how you do it. That's really kind of up to you. Um, and then then you push the beer through. You let the first little bit that's you know mixed with sanitizing solution, uh, you know, you divert it away from your receiving keg. And then you uh, you know once you're getting clear beer, uh, move move the uh, the receiving tube uh, to your your to your receiving keg. Which you've hopefully purged with CO two, and then you know let the beer, uh, let the beer flow into that. Mm-hmm. So right there, the first expense. Well, the first expense would be the filter and the housing. Filter itself, and then yeah, for for some of those kind of filters, you the filters aren't really that reusable. Uh, you need to buy it like a new pad. Um, I'm, I I don't know for sure if it's every time or, but they they get clogged pretty pretty soon. And then the, you've got another expense in that you have to have another, an additional keg uh, to push the beer from. You can't just rack out of a carboy through the filter. You've got to push it, so you, you first have to rack out of the carboy into a sanitized keg and then uh, then push it using CO2 through the filter into the keg that you're eventually going to be serving in. Right. You need two kegs. Yep. So car- cartridge filters, though, uh, they sound like uh, the kind of higher tech, uh, more reusable solution. Yeah, um, the one he talks about, especially you can um, apparently just yeah uh, you, know, you filter, and then you sort of run uh, liquid uh, sanitizing solution or cleaning solution through it backwards at the end, and sort of rinse out everything you you filtered, and um, you know according to him, it's reusable. Yeah, you've seen these these kind of cartridges if you've gone to uh, uh, the homebrew conference or if you've seen video of the homebrew conference. You know, people are are using these water filters as kind of their own, you know, Randall the enamel animal kind of thing where they put hops and and uh, fruits and I've even seen 
uh, roasted uh, peppers and, you know, whatever uh, into those uh, filter housings. You'd actually put a filter in to <laughs> do something radical <laughs> and put a filter in the filter housing uh, to filter your beer that way. Yeah. He, um, one thing he mentions, though, he says he's tried uh, the straight up like water filter varieties, and he says those don't work very well. The ones that are designed to, to, for whatever reason, the ones that are designed to use for use with water don't do very well. But he bought one, and he mentions the name in the, the article. Uh, those specifically designed for beverages. Graver Technologies. Yeah. Uh, the the point five micron unit he says costs forty five dollars plus shipping. So you know, it's a fairly substantial investment. Yeah, not too bad. But you know, if you can reuse it and if you take care of it. Um, you should uh, you should be okay. And one thing he does recommend is on the on the filter housings, the the plastic filter housings, uh, because the seal, I guess, uh, between the unfiltered side and the filtered side, uh, is kind of delicate. You want to make sure that you don't you know bang that around too much, or you'll be um, kind of shortcutting or short circuiting uh, your efforts on that side. Yeah, one one interesting advantage that he mentions with the cartridge filters is that because the cartridge is uh, a pressure vessel, uh, you can filter carbonated beer with it. I mean, when you know, when I think of filtering beer, I usually think of you know you rack it from the carboy to a keg, and it's not you know it doesn't have anything other than the you know residual CO two from fermentation in it. But with a cartridge filter, you can have your keg carbonated and then uh, then filter it. So what are the steps? I mean, what what are the when you're using one of these cartridge uh, uh, filters? Let's get into the nitty gritty. I mean, what what are the steps that you've got to go through? Yeah, basically, you need to. It's it's kind of two steps or two overall big steps. One is uh, taking the uh, the what he calls the racked beer keg, which is like your unfiltered beer keg, uh, filling that with a sanitizing solution. And pumping it all over to your receiving keg through the filter, so you you sanitize the filter that way, um, and then you take uh, you take the receiving keg that's full of sanitizing solution and push that out with CO2. So when you're done, you've got a sanitized filter. There's sanitizing solution running through the uh, the tubes, and you've got uh, the receiving keg that's um, full of CO2. So that as you because uh, one potential uh, down downside to filtering is if you do it wrong, uh, you'll end up oxidizing your beer. Mm-hmm. Like if you just took the filter dry, hooked it up to the the racked beer keg and the receiving beer keg, and you know there's there was air in the uh, receiving beer keg and just you know sort of pushed it so that it splashed through the the filter and and all that, it would pick up all that oxygen that was in the the tubes leading there and in the and in the filter itself because. There would be oxygen entrained in the in the filter mesh, um, and that would end up in your beer. So you've got to, you know, push a dilute sanitizing solution through to, uh, you know, it, it does a little bit of sanitizing, but but mostly you're displacing the oxygen and getting it ready. And then, once you've done that with sanitizing solution, you essentially repeat the entire thing with, but this time with beer. And um, like I said, you just. Uh, you start moving. At first, you're going to have some sanitizing solution, so you don't. The first things that come off, you'll just let, uh, you know, spray into your little bucket or whatever. But then, once beer starts coming out, then put the, uh, you know, the little lock, keg lock thing on the uh, receiving beer keg, and then start filling it. And then afterwards, after you get that all uh, uh, transferred over, you put your your nice finished keg at pressure into the uh, the refrigerator. Uh, and then to clean, you just basically take the take the thing apart and soak it in PBW for a while, right? Yeah, that's that's what he recommends. I've I've never done this before, so I'm just I'm going on what you know PC said and what I've I've seen other people do. But yeah, I think and sometimes people, depending on the filter and depending on how many times you're going to try to reuse it, some people might try to take like water or light sanitizing solution and push it backwards to the filter just to sort of knock out um, some of the things they filtered and, and 
give the uh, if it's a if it's a non reusable filter, you can extend the life sometimes a little bit that way. Although you really start running a risk if you're trying to reuse something that's meant to be disposable. So what if we're uh, what if we're homebrewers and we don't want to go to the uh, additional time and trouble and expense and effort uh, to get really clear beers? I mean, what what are the other alternatives? I mean, besides besides time, um, you can find your beer. There's different uh, uh, findings like ice and glass. Um, which, if I recall, gets rid of mainly yeast sediment. There's, uh, what's it, polyvinyl something, peridone, uh, PVPP. Um, that's, I, if I recall, that's this, um, it's the same plastic they use as the coating of when you, when you swallow like a pill, um, but it's shredded, and you put that through your... Uh, Put that through your home homebrew, and that'll filter out a lot of things. Or not filter out, but uh, fine out some things. So yeah, your your options are either filtering, fining, or time. That's and really it. Also, gelatin. I've used gelatin in the past. Yeah, gelatin. Um, you essentially uh, boil up some some water and, and mix in a, a packet of uh, unflavored. You know when you use <laughs> like lime gelatin. <laughs> 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 Uh, but uh, you know you don't you don't want to use uh, flavor gelatin, but the but the um, unless you're making Bud Light lime, <laughs> which may be an idea. <laughs> if you if you made your beer with Jello, maybe maybe Bill Cosby could help you advertise <laughs> Jello beer pops. Uh, anyway. Uh, <laughs> They, and the one thing about uh, gelatin is that when you use the uh, unflavored stuff, uh, you really get a reminder of what it is uh, when you when you put it in uh, boiling water by itself, because uh, you really get kind of that horse's hoof kind of uh, cow bone sort of smell. <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't uh, translate into your beer, uh, and I find uh, I have uh, find a, a pretty cloudy pale ale. In uh, quite a hurry. I mean, it it works pretty quickly. Um, but the 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 drawback in in my experience from using these fining agents is that you get this you get uh, an, a, a sort of a thicker layer of sediment on the bottom of your of your carboy that you that you got to leave behind. You got to be careful and leave behind. So you do, or at least in my experience, uh, you do sort of waste some beer. Uh, in doing that way. Is that your experience as well? Yeah, I've used uh, PVPP before, and um, it does it does settle out. It, at first it settles out into like a like a very thick layer almost, but it, then it just kind of compacts. But it, it's actually it, it does that really quickly. I mean, with, with PVPP you can do it like one day or even at night, and then by the morning it's uh, you know, it's pretty much compacted down into uh, its layer. And, and but the neat thing is, if you if you have it in a carboy, and you know you are, are just curious, you can go watch it like hour after hour. You know, just every every hour or so or half hour, go look at, and it's kind of cool because you see it. Um, if if your beer is clear enough to start with, you see the the uh, just a like a gradient of clarity in the uh, in the Carboy develop. I, I, I've never spent long periods of time looking at my carboy during any part of the brewing process. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you know you're a beer geek. You know you're a homebrew nerd if you if you spend a lot of time drinking homebrew, watching the yeast fly around in your glass carboy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't have notes on like how many bubbles per minute are coming out of my carboy at different hours or something from when I started. <laughs> no, I can't, I can't relate to that at all. It's alive. <laughs> <laughs> Even today, when I get a successful fermentation going, I'm just like fascinated. It, it worked again. <laughs> I did it again. Uh, and I like with, with some yeasts, like uh, 1968, you sometimes get that uh, – I sort of call it a lava lamp 
fermentation where you have the big clumps of yeast going churning up and down and you watch them it's like pretty <laughs> which would be an appropriate analogy for 1968 yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh well there you go so have you uh, so have you run through your have you run through your supply of uh, thanksgiving turkeys yet not yet i've uh i've still got a couple left <laughs> You stocked up. <laughs> I made turkey on Thanksgiving, and then about a week later, I made two more turkeys. <laughs> because I like turkey. <laughs> I was going to say you're a glutton for punishment, but you, you just may just be a glutton. I'm just a glutton, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I trust you had a good Thanksgiving. Uh, yeah, it was fun. How was yours? Yeah, it was good. I ate a bunch, and then uh, then we ate a bunch more. And uh, we didn't didn't fight too much with the family, uh, so <laughs> some foot some football was watched, and uh, you know there you go. Usually I brew my uh, cranberry beer right around Thanksgiving, but I didn't have time this year. I was kind of bummed. We'll talk but about that a little bit. That's <laughs> next. <laughs> that that's back on the subject <laughs> on the topic. But how do you make a cranberry beer? Um. It's it's real easy. You just make a light uh, wheat beer base, and I mean I've done everything from making an all grain batch of wheat beer to just dissolving wheat malt extract. Um, you know, make uh, I usually make it, you know, around ten forty four starting gravity, uh, lightly hopped since it's going to be a, a cranberry beer. And then what I do, you know, just ferment it out. Um, and you can you can go either with a with an actual wheat yeast, or I usually just use a a, a clean uh, ale yeast, uh, you know, for an American wheat style. Uh, but then basically, you just make cranberry relish. You take a bunch of cranberries for for a five gallon batch. Um, I don't know, but my recipe's on the the web somewhere. But it's a few pounds of cranberries, and then you take a uh, a Granny Smith apple and an orange, and you. You cut you cut them up, and the orange you cut the whole thing up, like including the rind hmm. that you leave in, and, and you mix that with the cranberries. Um, you know, send it through a like a Cuisinart, a food processor. I usually do it not. Uh, I don't grind it into the smallest possible thing because you're it's going to have some contact time with the beer for extraction. But you know, like coarsely grind it up the uh, the cranberries, the apple, and the orange. And then just rack the uh, rack the uh, wheat beer on top of it. I usually uh, like optimally, um, you know, the wheat beer is since it's relatively low in gravity, it's going to ferment pretty quickly. I like to rack it on out pretty much right when primary fermentation ends. Mm -hmm. uh, get it get it in there, uh, and the. The fruit has a, has a little bit of sugar in it, and that's going to restart a secondary fermentation. Um, do the secondary in a bucket, uh, and a bucket with a good like couple gallons of headspace. Uh, and then I give it a fruit contact time of maybe like five days or so, because the spear is like not not something that you know you you make to to age forever or anything. Right. Uh, it's it's quick. It's easy to make. You know the the base beer can be as easy as and and it might as well be as easy as just dissolving malt extract because you're not at the level of cranberries that that, that kind of takes over most of the flavor. Um, yeah, and so about fruit contact of about five days. Uh, yeah, then just move the beer to a keg from there. And, and yeah, when we're talking about filtration and, and beer loss, yeah, when you put like four pounds of uh, cranberry relish in a bucket, be prepared for uh, – the next level of beer loss. <laughs> it's not, another reason not to put too much effort into the wheat beers because you do lose a good, a good chunk of that. But you can, uh, you know, with a little bit of patient racking, you can get, uh, get a lot, of, you know, most of it out of there. And uh, yeah, it's it's just a decent, uh, you know, different kind of kind of beer. It's uh, just tart. You know, tastes like cranberries. You know, you can taste the little hint of the apple and the orange in there, and you can even, if you want to, uh, if you want to get fancy, uh, you can sort of put it in a keg and uh, instead of dry hopping it, cut up another like a quarter of an orange, including the peel and all that, 
and part of an apple and then sort of dry you know you don't really need any more cranberries but you know dry fruit it as opposed to dry hopping it and that works pretty well right you get the especially the orange uh uh, aromas will come out of the uh, out of the not necessarily the rind, but the the peel. That does sound tasty. Now, you could also, I guess, if you wanted to, uh, less effort would be to do, uh, say, a standard basic wheat beer and just use like a cranberry juice cocktail or something like that as a mixer, and do like uh, what do they call them, the shandies uh, sort of thing. Where you could just mix uh, fruit. Juice at serving time. Yeah, you could probably try that. You're a little skeptical about that, I can tell. But <laughs> I think the the big difference is that those, uh, if you take a cranberry, like uh, you know, Ocean Spray or whatever, those have a lot of sugar in them. Mm-hmm. And when you mix the beer in that, you're going to have it's going to be more sweet. Where this is, the beer is is was more dry. That's true. That's true. But it's, I mean, you could do it. It's worth a shot. What the heck? Yeah. I'd cut up and that'd be like the one beer that I would use an orange garnish on if I was going to do the sweet way. <laughs> well, there you go. We've uh, we've come for full circle, I think. Or maybe a, more of a Mobius loop kind of a deal. But, uh, <laughs> well, I appreciate it. It uh, This and this uh, article is an, uh, is an excerpt from uh, Dave's book uh, or it's or it's. Uh, excerpted from Dave's uh, Brew Like a Pro book. Mm-hmm. Just just came out, as far as I know. All kinds of good stuff out there to read. <laughs> All right, Chris. Well, we will uh, we will talk to you next time. Okay, talk to you then. Well, thanks again to Chris. If you'd like to have a free issue of Brew Your Own magazine, you can click on the ad on basicbrewing.com and if you decide to subscribe after reading that issue you'll be helping to support this show and uh, much appreciate everybody who does that don't forget to send us your brewing disasters stories Uh, you can send them to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com and please don't forget to tell us where you're from you can also send your show suggestions or brewing questions or whatever uh, to that address as well. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing Partial... uh, uh, Hello, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. Uh, We've got combo deals to save you a few bucks if you want to buy more than one DVD at a time. You can check out our basic brewing shirts in the store too. And our, don't forget, our brewers, our new Brewers Logbooks are on the store. Available to order as well. Uh, they are going out now. I'm really excited about that. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We ap- greatly appreciate the support. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Barely There Women's Flex to Fit Bikini, Soft Taupe, and Simplicity Boye Electric Yarn Ball Winder. And don't forget you can also join the American Home Brewers Association and subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links on it, basicbrewing.com. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by our buddy Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. Jello pudding!